So um, we're very pleased that she's speaking tonight. Um, she's so accomplished that I'm going to read some of her background because I can't remember everything. <laughs> so she's a professor here at ADU in biology. Um, um, she received her bachelor's degree in biology from Wright State University and then her uh, master's and PhD in molecular genetics from the Ohio State University. Um, she, we were here at the same State time. <laughs> President uh, Edwards and I overlapped, yes. Uh, then she did a postdoc uh, at Case Western Reserve. Uh, then she worked for the Cleveland Clinic as a virologist. Then she was the chief of virology at the Dayton Ohio VA Hospital. And she also taught at Wright State Medical School. Um, she joined our faculty in the year 2000. Um, she's twice won the Nicholson Award for the Outstanding Faculty Member here at ADU. I am very jealous of that award. Um, <laughs> She's currently working on her Master's of Theology degree with our seminary. Um, she's the uh, lead, author, lead author of several textbooks. Um, and uh, she has five children and one grandbaby. And one grandbaby, one grandbaby. yes. <laughs> so give her a round of applause. Unfortunately, the lights in this place are not conducive, so you all have to sit in the dark, but that means I can't see when you go to sleep. <laughs> all right, actually my postdoc was in African tropical diseases. Um, so this is, I wouldn't say near and dear to my heart, but this is something that I did work on um, in my postdoc. Um, mostly I worked on malaria and filariasis in my postdoc, which comes in very handy in Anderson, Indiana. <laughs> I did keep the presentation G-rated. I don't have any pictures of patients with Ebola um, because I wasn't sure what exact kind of audience I might have. But those of you who are in botany, when you get to my grow in the fall, expect the gross pictures. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the Ebola crisis. It was one year ago, almost to this month. It was the beginning of March that we declared, the World Health Organization declared a crisis. You haven't heard a lot about it, so is it gone or is it just hiding? Certainly hasn't had the headlines in the United States. Maybe. I tried it before. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to talk about four things. We're going to talk about this most recent Ebola crisis. We have some of the statistics, some of the maps, that sort of thing. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of Ebola and why this was the worst epidemic yet. We're going to do a little bit about, about the biology of Ebola, and then we're going to talk about what factors in particular led to this epidemic. And hopefully then, if we can correct some of those factors, what will prevent another epidemic. The recent Ebola crisis actually started in December of 213 with an index case of a two-year-old little boy named Emil. Emil lived in Guinea, in the southwest corner of Guinea. And he, they're not quite sure, because the entire village died in this Ebola outbreak. But he lived in a, what is called a reed and oil palm forest. Not a geography I'm familiar with. But supposedly this has a lot of fruit bats. And it is thought that he contracted this from the fruit bat. Unfortunately, the second patient was his sister. The third was his mother, the fourth was his father, and then it continued to spread. It killed the nurse, it usually kills health workers first, it killed the nurse and then the village midwife, and from there it started to spread. Again, all of this happens in very, very isolated regions in Guinea with essentially no medical care other than midwives and nurses. <coughs> This one ended up going to the hospital, which was a two-hour drive on very difficult roads. And from that point, it, it spread throughout the urban areas and the cities. So again, whether the young man was playing with a fruit bat or 
there was a dead fruit bat or whether they ate a fruit bat, nobody knows because no one from the village survived. The outbreak was not reported to the Guinea Ministry of Public Health until March of 2014. And as you can see by then, we've already had about 250 cases. This is this corner of Africa. This is Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, which are the three countries that were the most hit by this particular outbreak. So it originated here. You can see in these pictures, these are up on the CDC website, the progression of cases long before we ever knew about it. So it started in this area. You can see there's a lot of travel. The country borders are very porous. So there's a lot of fluid movement of people back and forth carrying Ebola as they go. It continued to spread in April. This is May, and you can see we are starting to hit the urban centers. This is June. It wasn't until August when we are up to 501 cases in certain areas that the World Health Organization declared an international public health emergency. This was about the time we started to hear about it. This is about the time that it hit the US newspapers. But you can see, we've already had three countries involved. At, still in September, they had not yet closed their borders. So there was still travel back and forth between all of these countries. First case on US soil was not diagnosed until October 1st. Um, Thomas Eric Duncan got the virus in Liberia and traveled to the US, although he claims that he was still healthy when he entered the United States. He died October 8th. There were three medical workers, two in Dallas that took care of him, one in Spain that took care of another uh, missionary doctor that also contracted the disease. But for the most case, all of the cases outside of this area were due to contact with a person from inside that area. So there were no um, sporadic cases that popped up outside of this main area. You can see that this is the capital of Liberia. We're starting to just spread through the urban areas very, very drastically. By the end of January, that is January as in last month, so 2015, the cases began to fall, but unfortunately there was a rise the first work week of February. So Ebola has not disappeared from this area. This is when the outbreak was officially declared. These are the case reports, and you can see this is the 11th of January. So they thought that things were going down. Unfortunately, it took a rise again in February. So you can see that Sierra Leone was hit very, very hard in comparison to Guinea, which started. Sierra Le Leone, interestingly, had one <coughs> index case that I'll talk about in a little bit, and that's what caused this entire outbreak in the country, one person. So it is not gone, it is not hiding, it's just not that we're hearing about it in the United States. This is the CDC's latest, February 20th, their latest statistics on number infected and death rate. In these three countries, we're looking at 20, over 23,000 people that are infected, 9,400 deaths. That's a death rate of about 40%, which is not particularly high for Ebola, as I will show you. Um, to give you some kind of comparison, the 1918 influenza epidemic, which resulted, I'm sure you all have heard about the casualties of the 1918 influenza um, epidemic. The death rate for that was 2.5%. If you get invasive MRSA, which remember when we were all very afraid of invasive MRSA, that death rate runs around 20%. So we're looking at two to four times that death rate. Here are, is the map today, this is a, well, as of February 25th, and the green areas are where we have had new cases in the last 21 days. So it is still, still going. 
So the Ebola crisis is entering a new phase. Um, they claim that the exponential phase is over, but if the goal is to completely eliminate this from the human population, they have a long, long way to go. The history of Ebola, it was originally called Ebola hemorrhagic fever. They shortened it to Ebola, just because it makes better press headlines. Hemorrhagic informs exactly what happened. You bleed to death out of all of your orifices. There is no clotting. It was the first discovered in 1976. Some of you weren't alive in 1976, but for some of us, we were already in college in 1976. That doesn't seem really that long ago. Near the Ebola River in Zaire, viruses are often named for the location where they are found. Viruses are not considered living, so they don't have a genus and a species name like Homo sapiens or Staphylococcus aureus. So instead, they are just named after where they're found. So Ebola came from the Ebola River in Zaire, what is now considered the Democratic Republic of the Congo right here. And there have been sporadic outbreaks between 1976 and 2013. The size of the circles in this picture correlates with the number of people that have died in particular outbreaks. So you can see most of them were situated here, and not that many. The biggest one here is 200 people died in those outbreaks. Interestingly, in this area, South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, in that area, the Ebola warnings and the education have been out since 1976, which is why it's unlikely we would have had an epidemic as large had it started here. These people had never had a case of Ebola, didn't recognize it, and didn't practice some of the preventative measures that are already in place in this area of the country. I picked just a few of the sporadic outbreaks. I didn't pick all of them. 1976, this was the first one, 318 human cases. The death rate was 88%. They never did find the reservoir for this. They do not know what the index case was. This was actually discovered by American missionaries who happened upon a village in which everyone had bled to death. They thought that it had been a slaughter that there had been some kind of a tribal warfare and all these people had been killed. So being good missionaries, they washed all of the bodies and buried them. And then they got sick, which is probably the only reason the West heard about it was because American missionaries were involved. We then had an outbreak in Sudan, about 53%. They were studying it in England. This is a needle stick, a medical worker who was working with contaminated samples. Notice that the death rate, of course, when you only have one person and they live, that gives you a 0%. That's how you can manipulate statistics to tell the story you want. But if you have early treatment, you have a much better chance of surviving. We have had multiple medical workers infected outside of Africa. Again, from needle sticks, working with contaminated samples, doing autopsies, that sort of thing. Um, we did have Ebola in the United States in 1989, but there were no human cases. This was very interesting. Um, and I remember this because I was doing my postdoc in African tropical diseases. And um, they had dozens of macaques in the Reston, Virginia quarantine fa uh, facility. They had imported all of these macaques from the Philippines, and they started bleeding to death and dying. And so they were growing whatever it was they thought was killing these people, or these macaques, in tissue culture flasks. And a researcher happened to send a sample via FedEx <laughs> okay. to another facility to be looked at underneath an electron microscope. And when they looked at it, the guy, apparently the guy recognized, and I'll show you a picture of what the virus looks like. It's very distinctive. 
recognized it, picked up the phone, and said, oh my god, we're in trouble. Um, that one never did infect humans, although four, well, it never did cause symptoms. Four humans, the caregivers, were infected, but they never developed any symptoms. So the difference between the virus that infected here and the virus that infected here is something that they're working on. One of the things that they're doing is sequencing all of the isolates that they have in the deep freeze and comparing and seeing what changes <coughs> there are between these. We have had in macaques imported from the Philippines this same virus multiple times. So this, this has entered the U.S. before. So you can see we have you know, relatively small numbers, relatively high death rates. So this latest epidemic actually has a lower death rate than what was expected. This is what Ebola looks like. It's very distinctive. It's a called a filovirus because it looks like a long, thin filament. Viruses have different types of capsids or shells that surround them. This one is very distinctive. Only one family of viruses looks like this. These are RNA viruses, which means that their genetic material is RNA and not DNA, which means that you would think it would be very, very easy to destroy. It is killed by bleach, but apparently, as I will show you later, it can survive in dead bodies for over a week. So that is one of the problems. Five identified strains, the Ebola strain, the Sudan strain, the Typhora strain, I don't think I'm going to try to say this one, Bundabagio, and the Reston strain. This is from Reston, Virginia. I told you we named them for the places we found them. So that was the Reston strain, which is not known to cause disease in humans. It does cause disease in humans, non-human primates, or the, the Ebola viruses, monkeys, gorillas, chimpanzees. It can infect fruit bats. It can infect antelope but it doesn't seem to cause the same disease in those animals as it does in the humans and the non-human primates. Again, that's one of the things that the sequencing <coughs> projects are working on. What is the difference and why can it infect some organisms and not cause disease? Do they have some sort of an immune response that we don't have? What's, what's going on with that? And we still just don't know enough. They know that it is definitely animal-born and that it has an African host. All of the outbreaks have started in an African country. So they are looking at animals that live in Africa, obviously. The animal reservoir is unknown. So whether it hides, like between 76 and the next outbreak, where did it go? There were no human cases. There were no cases they could find, and yet it came back. So is it hiding someplace in animals? And then it, the transmission mode from animal to human is called a spillover event. We're still not sure how that spillover event occurs. How does the animal transmit it to a human? They claim, this is on the CDC's website, it's likely the butchering of infected animals and blood contact and the website actually uses these exact words. It's not likely to be airborne. I, I would prefer something a little more definitive than not likely to be airborne. This is one of the reasons that they were very interested in the village where the little boy Emil lived and the index case to see if he had just been playing in an area where there were bats, or if he had actually you know, butchered a bat, eaten a bat, you know, picked up a dead bat, but again, we don't know. So, fruit bats, this is a picture of your fruit bat. Nasty looking teeth, but they're not, not used on humans. Or primates. Again, bats and primates are used, bush meat, for food. So it could be either one. Human-to-human -human transmission. There were lots of um, parentheses in this definition. 
Uh, read the uh, bold ones first. Direct contact with blood or body fluids of a person who's sick with Ebola or objects that have been contaminated with the virus. But just in case that doesn't, isn't all encompassing enough, direct contact through some kind of broken skin or some kind of mucous membrane, eyes, nose, or mouth, with body fluids, including but not limited to urine, saliva, sweat, feces, vomit, breast milk, and semen. Semen appears to be infective as long as the virus is still present. It has been found as long as seven weeks after the person no longer has symptoms. And so they recommend no sexual encounters for three months. And they're not positive that it isn't in semen after three months, but that's the current recommendation. The person who's been sick or objects that have been contaminated, like needles, syringes, bedding, gloves, surfaces, etc. And these can be contaminated from either infected humans, fruit bats, or the primates. They have found that the virus is still infective after six days, so that even in dead animals or dead humans, six days later the virus is still <laughs> infective. Um, easily clean, easily killed by bleach. I mean, it's not that we can't kill this. You know, we just need bleach. This is the health staff putting up an isolation perimeter around an Ebola. You can see this is where we put Ebola patients. So we're not talking modern hospitals uh, to a large extent. Symptoms of Ebola. The initial symptoms are sudden fever, muscle pain, fatigue, headache, and sore throat, most of which somebody in here probably has right now. Right? Very, very non-specific symptoms. And that's why when the very first case in the United States went into an emergency room in Dallas, and apparently the doctors didn't know he had been traveled, or had traveled from Liberia, he had very non-specific symptoms. You send him home, tell him to get a good night's sleep. Okay. This is followed by vomiting, diarrhea, rash, and bleeding. Definitely not non-specific symptoms. The bleeding is both internal and external, can be seen in the gums, the eyes, the nose, and the feces. Usually, one of the first signs of internal bleeding is that the whites of the eyes go red. And then, at that point, it's very, very difficult to reverse. Patients tend to die from dehydration and multiple organ failure. One of the reasons early treatment is effective is it can prevent the dehydration. Um, the pictures are not for the faint of heart. I used a diagram here, but the, the pictures of the patients, especially the children, are just heartrending. So, um, forewarned. The symptoms tend to appear between 2 and 21 days after infection. This is one of the interesting things. 21 days seems to be the limit. They haven't had anybody come down after 21 days. Again, why is there such a specific infectious period? You are infected, and within 21 days, you show symptoms. Again, that's not clear, but there's not a whole lot of basic research on this virus. Patients are not contagious until they begin to show symptoms. Once they begin to show symptoms, then they are highly, highly contagious. Early treatment is the key. Uh, supportive care is the only treatment. There are no FDA-approved vaccines. There is no FDA-approved medicine. This is keep them hydrated and pray that their immune response will pull them through. So, there is an experimental drug. This is called ZMAP. This was produced by the company MAP Biopharmaceutical. It was made available to the first two doctors that were infected and flown back to the U.S., um, the two doctors who were employed by Samaritan's Purse. And this was paid for by Samaritan's Purse. 
It is an experimental drug. It had not been approved by the FDA. And so the US government would not give official permission to utilize the drug. It was, they were going to die anyway. They chose, and Samaritan's Purse chose to have them treated. What it is, MAP stands for monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are antibodies like you or I would make against something that infected us, but these are produced in a mouse, and they happen to be all identical. When you're infected with, say, influenza or something, you will develop antibodies, a whole array of antibodies against the influenza that will protect you the next time that same virus comes knocking at your door. The Monoclonal antibodies are all identical, produced in a mouse, and they actually used three different antibodies mixed together and gave it to these people, these two doctors, and it worked. Unfortunately, it's gone. So it takes a while to grow it. Um, the actual cells are available. But you have to grow it in tissue culture. It takes 30 to 45 days to produce a batch. And so they used up all they had on that initial um, experiment. They are working on gaining FDA approval, but they have to build up the stocks in order to be able to do clinical trials before they can start. Um, they are also looking about or looking at using the antibodies from the survivors. If you survived Ebola, you should have antibodies against it. They have shown that people who were infected in 1976 who lived still have antibodies. So the antibodies are long lasting. So one of the things that they have been trying um, in West Africa is transfusions from a person who has been infected and recovered, and a person who is currently infected. Um, still a scary prospect. Factors that led to this epidemic, and hopefully if we can reverse these factors, then we could prevent the next epidemic, if is a big if. This picture ought to make all my micro students shudder. They are drying their gloves outside on sticks. And then they are going to reuse these gloves. Not a lot of disposable gloves. So here are the boots, here are the gloves that are all being dried so that they can be reused. Assuming, of course, that they were correctly washed the first time. So we have a lack of qualified doctors and nurses. This gives you the number of people for every doctor. Here's the United States, about 410. Here's Liberia, 70,000 people per doctor. Not a lot of medical care. Liberia only had 60 doctors that were considered uh, board licensed. Most of them died in the early months of the outbreak. And so the entire healthcare system in Liberia was decimated at the beginning. They also have very poorly equipped medical facilities, not a lot of disposables, and that's been a big problem. Poor health system infrastructure. These are both pictures taken from uh, Monrovia, Liberia. Fairly modern city, fairly crowded. But this is the makeshift treatment hospital. And as you can see, they're actually going out and dragging patients in from the streets to this facility. Um, there is no infectious disease or healthcare monitoring. There are no diseases that you have to report, like to the local health department or the state health department or the, that whole infrastructure we have built doesn't exist. There was a 14-year civil war in Liberia that ended in 2003 that destroyed most of the infrastructure. The hospitals that exist in Liberia are mostly Catholic hospitals that have been built since the war. Everything before or during the civil war was destroyed. 
There is no monitoring of the remote villages. This is the name of the village where Emil lived. It's very isolated and it's a two hour drive on some very difficult roads to get to the nearest medical treatment. And so if you have a whole village disappear when it's that isolated, it doesn't tend to get reported. There are also lots of overcrowded urban areas and slums, again, with no monitoring whatsoever. Very porous borders. Immigration checkpoint, you know, the, the trade routes between the different countries do not normally go through roads. And so setting up immigration checkpoints on major roads is essentially useless. Um, the notice that the sign here is in English. Okay. Very fluid population movement. And when they found out that there was an Ebola outbreak, they all left carrying the infected patients, carrying the virus with them as they spread out from the center. So it's their um, country borders are similar to our state borders in terms of the ability to cross. And insufficient education and changes in the cultural practices, especially the burial practices. One of the U.S. doctors that's with the CDC said they need to transform tradition, or that their trans tradition results in transmission. So apparently burial customs are very important, and if it comes to either dying of Ebola or having your loved one not be able to go on to their eternal reward, they would rather die of Ebola. Because the rituals are so important for the afterlife. The, um, apparently, and I thought this was interesting on the CDC website, it said their religious ceremonies involve hugging. Like, okay, yeah, so do I. <laughs> I have a problem with that. Apparently that's a problem. This is a quote that came from the BBC. In Uganda and the Dominican Republic of the Congo, the education message about avoiding contact has had years to enter the collective consciousness, 1976. So that's been a while to adjust the cultural practices. In West Africa, there simply hasn't been the time necessary for the cultural shift. The cases, 365 initial cases in Sierra Leone were as a result of one person who came to a funeral in Liberia, washed, and prepared the body for burial, and then went back to Sierra Leone, directly infecting 365 patients. So one unsafe burial ended up basically costing Sierra Leone. Now this is a direct quote from a group called Medica Liberia. This is a group that protects women and children in various African countries, but this is their solution. They are demanding from the German government and the World Health Organization a long-term commitment to reestablish their healthcare systems, the sufficient resources to fit out the medical faculty appropriately, which includes not only medical schools, nursing schools, midwife schools, but also the equipment that need, is needed to train those people, and the laboratories that are needed to do the basic work, to ensure that Liberia is not indefinitely dependent on outside aid, and investment in the infrastructure, Liberia is unable to do such a thing at this point, needed to enable access to health service in the rural areas. None of the rural areas areas have any sort of monitoring, as I mentioned before, but there are also no vaccines for childhood diseases. So when these people move from the villages into the urban areas, then just normal childhood diseases rampantly go through the population. Psychosocial and trauma counseling for the population, if you look at some of the pictures, you know, you can understand, and when you realize that entire villages were wiped out, you can understand that. 
and an improvement in obstetrics in order to decrease the high maternal mortality rates. These are some of the suggestions um, to avert the crisis or the next crisis. So is it gone? No, it is still present. It is not hiding. Um, it is still here. It just doesn't happen to be among us as in the United States. Um, one of the <coughs> CDC messages is that it is time to define us differently. That if someone can get in, on a plane in Liberia and be in Dallas the next day, then it is time to define who us is and be a little more proactive in terms of our monitoring and help for other countries. Any questions? then their immune system will kick in. But we just, if we don't get them before the bleeding starts, then, okay. So a virus is alive. A virus is not alive. But a bleach kills it. So it well, is something that isn't alive. So what they, <laughs> what? And, and they have life cycles too, which is very confusing. Okay. Actually, bleach inactivates it. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. That so is the, it, it really, it can't reactivate after you bleached it? After you bleached it, it doesn't exist anymore. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So it's not really dead, it's just inactive. It wasn't alive to begin with, <laughs> yeah. so it's inactive. Okay. Right. It All is right. not infectious. Okay. And it's funny because in my lecture on uh, viruses in microbiology, I start with viruses are not alive. And then the next slide, I say, now we're talking about the life cycle of the virus. Yeah. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm having a hard time with the was until about June or July. So um, a team from the New England Journal of Medicine actually went and did the research and dug it up. But it took a while because there's just not good reporting. But exactly how they did that, I don't know. And the whole, yeah, the whole village is gone. I'm assuming that there was a report. They sent somebody out. Somebody talked to somebody. They did interviews and came up with it, but I don't know exactly. Yes? So I'm curious, it's, uh, it's not alive, but what is it that it does when it gets into your system? I mean, It I, actually I hijacks ask. your cells. So it gets inside of your cells, it shuts down your cell, so all of the normal activities of your cell shuts down and then starts using your cell basically as a factory to make more copies of itself. I see. So it, it's a pirate. So what's the, what's the future of this current outbreak of Ebola? The CDC has their pro, uh, projections online and it's not pretty. Um, the, the projections have almost double the number of um, 
interesting case studies. Maybe I'll show you. You probably don't want to look at all my case studies. Um, online, uh, the projections are about double what they have currently. So they expect us to have another 23,000 cases. And then it eventually goes to hopefully zero, and then we wait for the next bad yeah. infection. Yeah. <clears throat> Which is, and, and since we don't know where it hides or what animal reservoir it lives in, we don't know how to stop that. That's part of that. Remember that I heard you talk about the way this virus mutates? Yes. Uh, can you explain how it behaves differently from other viruses as far as that's concerned? RNA viruses, um, but all of our cells contain DNA, and we have enzymes that replicate our DNA, and our enzymes are very faithful to replicate our DNA so that each cell is identical to the cell that it came from. So there aren't a lot of mutations. If there were a lot of mutations, we'd all be weirder than people. <laughs> Say that nicely. As far as the RNA things are concerned, RNA viruses are the only thing that have an RNA genome. The enzymes that replicate RNA are very, very error prone. And so they constantly change. So every time they replicate, make copies, we get differences, we get changes. This is, influenza is an RNA virus. It's one of the reasons that we have to have new vaccines every year because the virus mutates fairly rapidly. So RNA viruses are, HIV is an RNA virus. It's one of the reasons we don't have a vaccine against HIV. We can't keep the virus from changing. Now, things like smallpox is a DNA virus. It's very easy to get a vaccine because the virus doesn't change. The one that infected you know, 200 years ago is still pretty much identical to the one that we have today. We do. So with the Z map that they're making, the antibodies? That's why they pool three of them. Is that going to be enough though to stop whatever's next? We Will don't the Z map be ready in time for this effort? My guess is that they're already worrying about that problem. But that that's probably uh, proprietary information in this by a pharmaceutical company. All right, so the global ethical question of travel and put this into new populations. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have in 24 great, hours. greatly restricted the borders and, and travel to those areas right now. Have we essentially condemned the people of that area uh, to live with Ebola, with Ebola and, and with the uncertainty of the best we can do is keep you hydrated? Apparently, when they originally closed the borders for those three countries, they were um, they were told to shoot people who tried to cross the border. Right. And there were so many people that the soldiers trying to hold the border couldn't hold them mm -hmm. because so many people wanted out. So yes, I think that that's ethically <coughs> a serious concern. You know, who, who do we give ZMAP to, um, and who do we not give it to? Well, I suppose a lot of insurance com companies aren't going to cover it, so I think we can afford it. And in the case of Samaritan's Purse, Samaritan they, Purse. they, they pay that for organization it. paid for it, and I can't imagine what they paid. I, that, I don't know. Yeah. Part of the reason in the news here in the States was also the election cycle and the finger pointing. Mm. Would you say the... I don't do elections. I know. Would you say the CDC uh, was a little behind the curve? Were they handed with the public? Was there some obfuscation? I think there was some obfuscation, and the director of the CDC has admitted that there was some obfuscation. 
But I think part of it was because they thought they knew more than they knew. I think when the first Dallas nurse was infected after using proper protocol, that just floored them. And I think there was a real scramble to kind of, okay, could it be respiratory? And, that, and they still are not willing to say it is not respiratory. They just are willing to say it is not likely respiratory. Does the virus affect certain types of cells? Like what makes it hemorrhagic fever instead of like tumors if it's like uncontrolled cell growth? There, it interferes with blood clotting cascade, which happens to be kind of a side effect of one of the genes of the virus. So that's not even its main, or if the virus has a purpose, but it interferes with the, yeah, not living things do they have purposes. <laughs> do you think that the mortality rate for this outbreak was lower because of something in the virus strain or because of That's what they're hoping. Yeah. They are hoping that this strain is just less virulent okay. than the prior strains. So that's one of the reasons they're sequencing all of those, and there's a big push to do the, the sequencing of all of the um, different patient isolates. And they actually have um, sent in um, liquid nitrogen containers to basically evacuate as many patient specimens as they can. Mm -hmm. well, wouldn't you say it's worse that um it has a 40% death rate because it has more likelihood to uh, travel along the population and uh, get dispersed. I'm sorry, say that again? Um, wouldn't it be worse in a way that it has a lower death rate because it has the death it would, rate? It would travel further, but I mean, sort of like, I mean, influenza has 2.5%, or the 1918 had 2.5%. That's pretty high for a disease Nowadays, we consider that fairly high. Um, yes, <coughs> lower disease rates would transmit further, but we all live through the common cold and we're okay with that. So. Thank you all for coming out on such a cold night.